Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On, and welcome to Module 4 of the Droner's Guide to the 2019 Canadian RPAS Regulations. In this module, we'll be referring to the basic safety regulations as listed below. But first, I want to remind you that this entire presentation package from the Droner's Guide to the 2019 RPAS Regulations training series is available for a nominal fee. See the link in the description be below. What you'll get is a PDF soft copy format of the entire presentation package over 100 pages of solid material covering every one of the 901 regulations and with clear explanations for each and every rule. Included in this are active links to additional resources that will be very helpful for you in understanding these rules and regulations and standards. And as a bonus, I'll throw in a free starter droning logbook with your purchase of the Droner's Guide material. This Excel spreadsheet soft copy file will be included with your purchase. What it is, is a multi-tabbed spreadsheet. Each of the tabs covers one or more of the requirements for procedures, identification, or logging that the new regulations require. I've pre-filled it with starter information and each of the sheets is easily customizable to your own operations, your own drone, and everything else. You can do it yourself, but why would you bother? You can start with mine. Okay, let's get started with this module. The very first of the regulations is actually before any of the 901 series, and it's 900.06, called Reckless or Negligent Operation. Bottom line is, you're expected to operate your drone safely. If you do something stupid, you could still be charged, even if you didn't break a specific rule. So please think before you fly and fly safely. And just to make sure, I'm gonna read through this exact, the wording in the regulations. No person shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system in such a reckless or negligent manner as to endanger or be likely to endanger aviation safety or the safety of any person. The next regulation is 901.11 and it's fundamental to all of these droning regulations and comes up time and time again and essentially it's keep visual line of sight at all times. 901.11 says you need to be able to keep your drone in sight without aids like binoculars at all times and to help with this a visual observer can be a huge help. So let's make sure that we all understand what visual line of sight means. It's defined in the regulations and it says visual line of sight means unaided visual contact at all times with a remotely piloted aircraft that is sufficient to be able to maintain control of the aircraft, know its location, and be able to scan the airspace in which it is operating in order to perform the detect and avoid functions in respect of other aircraft or objects. So really, it's more than just knowing where your aircraft is, because theoretically you could do that by looking on your phone, for example, if you're operating your drone by a phone. But it's really to enable you to, or to ensure that you are able to see around you. So scan the airspace and make sure that you're not running into or could run into any other aircraft or trees or buildings or people or anything like that. All right, so this one's also very important and very fundamental to these rules. In addition, they emphasize it in Rule 901.16, Flight Safety. You must stop immediately if aviation safety or the safety of any person is endangered or likely to be endangered. So just stop if there's a problem immediately. 901.17 a pretty sensible one, um, yielding to regular aircraft. You must give way or yield to any regular aircraft, including hot air balloons. So they, they describe it as a pilot of remotely piloted aircraft shall give way to power driven, heavier than air aircraft, airships, gliders, and balloons at all times. Your remotely piloted aircraft is, is second, always. 90118. Stay away from other aircraft. Do not fly close to other aircraft such that you risk collision. 
And by the way, you can fly in formation, like with another pilot of, an, of another drone, for example, if you arrange this in advance with other pilots. I'll cover this in Module 7, I believe, the uh, special cases, and that is Regulation 901.36. So you can fly with other aircraft, but you have to arrange it in advance. So the wording that they have is no pilot shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft in such proximity to another aircraft as to create a risk of collision. Actually, pretty clearly worded. 901.19, fitness of crew members. Again, this is a fundamental basic safety rule that they are emphasizing in these new regulations. You and all crew members must be fit to perform their duties no alcohol consumption within prior 12 hours. Now, this has caused a lot of dialogue on uh, social media, certainly, um, comparing it to driving and alcohol, uh, none of which should be uh, mixed, of course. But the 12-hour the thing is seems quite onerous. And the, the reason or where this came from is aviation rules that forbid a manned, pilot, uh, a manned aircraft pilot from consuming any alcohol in the prior 12 hours. Probably a good idea. Um, in addition to alcohol, you are not allowed to be under the influence of any drug that may impair safety. And I think that includes the obvious other drugs, as well as perhaps even prescription drugs that uh, could make you drowsy or anything like that. And uh, in addition to alcohol and drugs, they also want to make sure that you're not overly tired. So if you're, you or your crew are suffering from fatigue such that they cannot safely operate the aircraft, then they shouldn't be doing that. All right, so a very important fundamental rule in the new regulations. The next basic safety rule is 90120 regarding visual observers. And again, a visual observer is defined down here. Um, it's a trained crew member. And there's no definition of how you train someone to be a visual observer explicitly, but there you go. Um, this is the uh, Transport Canada definition, by the way. Visual observer means a trained crew member who assists the pilot in ensuring the safe conduct of a flight under visual line of sight. The key rules, and there, there's quite a bit of uh, verbiage here, but the key rules are they must be able to communicate with the pilot quickly and reliably. So, you know, a visual observer, uh, you know, a kilometer away isn't, isn't going to necessarily help unless they have uh, walkie talkies or are in phone communication or some sort of thing like that. Um, they don't say how they, you know, they're not regulating how you do that, but you must be able to communicate with the pilot quickly and reliably. Um, they must tell the pilot about hazards, both in the air and on the ground. So uh, the expectation is that a visual observer says, look out, there's a helicopter that's just uh, uh, risen up uh, two kilometers away, we better go and land, for example, or uh, by the way, the drone is just about to fly into a tree. Uh, they can only be a visual observer for one RPA to RPA or drone at a time. So you can't uh, say have three people uh, droning and have one visual observer that shared amongst you. Nope, you need one for every drone. And that makes sense because their, their job is to keep an eye on that drone and the surroundings of that drone. Can't do that if they're on opposite sides or, or whatever. Um, and uh, this, this one came up by the way in the exam, at least my exam, is that they cannot be operating any moving vehicle, boat, or for that matter, a plane. Imagine being a visual observer from a plane. Um, at any rate, they, um, uh, they can't be operating any of those things. They can be in a moving vehicle or on a boat, uh, but they can't be the operator of those, those um, vehicles. The pilot is in charge, rule 901.21. Um, in case this isn't obvious, the pilot is in charge during the flight and all crew members, so visual observer being the uh, most likely crew member, must comply with the pilot's instructions. Next, 90137. Similar to the visual observer rule, the pilot 
cannot also be operating a moving vehicle, a vessel, a boat, in other words, a boat, or a manned aircraft. I assume this also means a bicycle or a motorcycle. Um, I haven't seen a specific definition of that, but I, I am almost certain that that would also cover those scenarios. You cannot be riding a bike and flying a drone at the same time. Next, 90132, always be prepared to take control. This is kind of an odd one. Um, but it, what it says is you must always be able to take control of, a, of the drone even if it is operating a pre-programmed, which they describe as autonomous, flight procedure. So for example, if you um, uh, in, invoke a point of interest circle uh, around, uh, say, a statue or a building or something like this, um, and that, that's uh, an autonomous flight procedure, you, you can't just uh, say, oh, isn't that cool? You have to be on the controls and available to take control if something goes wrong. Sensible rule, and that's why it's part of the basics. Next, 901.49. This is about correcting problems that result in incidents. The uh, Transport Canada title is Incidents and Accidents Associated Measures and pretty complicated wording here, my interpretation makes it a little more clear. Stop your flight and ensure corrective actions are taken to prevent recurrence if any of the following occur. The first one is injury to a person requiring medical attention. So first of all, obviously deal with the injury, deal with the person, make sure that they're okay and that they get the medical attention that they need. But before just putting a new battery in and flying off again, Think about what happened, think about how that incident occurred, and take preventive action to ensure it doesn't happen again. Similarly, if your aircraft has unintended contact with a person, or if unanticipated damage occurs to any part of the aircraft, maybe, maybe you crash or a propeller breaks or something like that, um, don't just take off again. Figure out what caused the problem, um, maybe the propeller failed because they are getting old and so you should change all of the propellers not just the one that that failed as an example similarly anytime you exceed altitude limits or proximity limits say you accidentally come within 30 meters of people for example um, figure out how that happened what went wrong in in your system or your visual observers or whatever and um, make corrective action Certainly if there's a collision with another aircraft or even a close call, figure out what happened and take corrective actions. Anytime the aircraft becomes uncontrolled, say you lose a communication link, think about it. Is, are your antennas all right? Um, is, is there perhaps radio interference where you're flying? Consider these things, take corrective action. And of course, if a police report is filed, or what's called a civil aviation daily occurrence is reported, then you absolutely must take corrective action to ensure that that doesn't happen again. You might wonder, what is a civil aviation daily occurrence? And I wondered that too, and I was fascinated and ended up being distracted for about an hour uh, while I looked into it. So here's the link to uh, the civil aviation daily occurrence reporting system. This is available online and it is uh, you can query um, any incident at any time in the past. There's all sorts of search criteria you can use. I just entered a couple of dates. I think they were two weeks apart and 300 and some odd occurrences came up and they were fascinating to read. Things like the runway at CYVB was closed due to ice and snow or this air, airplane uh, declared an emergency due to a gear problem. They resolved it in a holding pattern and then landed without incident or this guy that that blew a tire on landing and had to be towed away to clear the runway. Fascinating uh, reading in my nerdish way, I guess. So that's what a civil aviation daily occurrence report is. If that or any of those other issues occur, stop, think about it, take your corrective action before just flying away and, and continuing. So that's it. We've covered all of the 
basic safety regulations in the 2019 Canadian RPAS regulations under the general operating and flight rules um, sector. So congratulations on completing module four. I recommend you move on to module five after this and uh, that, that module covers pre-flight checks. And as always, a reminder that the present presentation material for this and all of the uh, training materials in my training series is available in one neat package available for a nominal fee via the link in the description below. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe to my channel and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you again.